Hi, and welcome to the Modern Persian Food Podcast. We are food bloggers, Bita Arabian and Bita Nazim Kelly, and we're here to share with you the rich flavors and fresh ingredients of Persian cooking and how to incorporate them into today's modern lifestyles. We're excited to introduce you to the flavors, tastes, and techniques we use, and also our own cultural stories and perspectives growing up in the U.S. in a Persian family. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to episode number 12 of the Modern Persian Food Podcast, where Bita and I will be talking about soups, Persian soups, lovely, delicious, comforting Persian soups, specifically their claimed hearty Oshirishte soup, which is one of our favorites, and some other favorites that we have. We will talk about how we make them, how we serve them, and more importantly, how we eat and enjoy them. Bita Jun, how are you today? Hi, Bita Jun. I'm doing well, thank you. I am also ready for a nice, warm, nutritious bowl of soup. So let's get into it. Let's talk about Oshirishte. What is Oshirishte? Osh is Farsi for soup. Reshta is Farsi for the type of noodle. It's a flour noodle that is in the soup. It's a flat noodle, very similar to linguine in my opinion, or fettuccine. I usually just pick up some linguine. It's really delicious and nutritious, highly nutritious. I would go as far as to say the healthiest Persian dish you can eat. If there's a healthier Persian dish, let us know. I want to know what it is. Yeah. I used to call it Persian vegetarian detox soup. Oh, wow. There are so many fresh ingredients and healthy fiber filled beans and legumes, which provide plant based protein and healthy fibers and all the vitamins and minerals that are in the fresh herbs. It's filling because it has beans and noodles and it helps with digestion because of everything that's in it. It's just an all around besides all the health benefits, super delicious soup. How do you feel about Asherishte? I love Asherishte that has a variety of different beans in it, garbanzo beans, and you could have red beans and white beans. I personally like to add black eyed peas to mine and a lot of herbs, cilantro, parsley. You could put dried herbs in there as well and a ton of spinach actually. And my big trick that I do when I make Asherishte is I actually use frozen spinach because it's just readily available. It's super easy. So the way that I like to make ashirishte is, as I start off almost every Persian dish that I make, is sauteing onions and then adding some turmeric and then basically sauteing some of the fresh herbs at the beginning. And another cheat is that you can actually use canned beans. You can soak all the different beans like overnight or for a handful of hours, or you can use canned beans. And if I do use canned beans, I actually rinse them. I don't use the liquid that they're in. I rinse them off and put it with the spinach and add water and let it just simmer away for a while, depending on if you're cooking your beans or not cooking the beans. And then when it's like almost ready, everything has kind of come together, then at that point I would add the noodles. I also like to add a tiny bit of cinnamon when I make ashirishta. Again, it just gives like a little bit of a different flavor that you may not be expecting. A lot of times you can't even taste the cinnamon in there. It's just like a little bit of a warming taste that really makes it extra comforting for me. Nice. Is that kind of how you make it too? Very similar. I don't put cinnamon. Mm -hmm. I think we should mention that this is a really traditional soup and it is simple. And traditionally, I think that Iranian chefs would make everything from scratch if possible. It tastes delicious that way. If you have time to cook your own beans and use all fresh ingredients. Mm -hmm. But I don't mind opening a can of organic beans. So I use canned chickpeas, canned kidney beans, white beans are often used either instead of kidney beans or along with them. I usually do like half a can of kidney beans and half black eyed peas. I love the taste of black eyed peas. I think that lentils are delicious and extremely nutritious. I tell my pregnant friends to eat lentils. It's brain food. It's going to make your baby smart. When I start out with the soup, I do grill diced onions with garlic. I like a lot of garlic in it Mm -hmm. and some turmeric and salt and pepper. Then I just add the herbs for a quick saute, a wilt. The spinach wilts down quickly. Then I use vegetable broth. It is a vegetarian detox soup. Mm -hmm. But at the very end, of course, add the noodles. So, um, My girls love pasta, and so when I make the ash, I put extra noodles, in fact, and then what happens is that 
because of all the beans and noodles, the broth kind of soaks up quickly. So I usually have to add more broth or water. Yeah. There's different garnishes and toppings that I find so delicious for this Asherish de Persian noodle and bean soup, specifically for this soup. What do you like to put on top or mix into yours? I love fried onions. That's a traditional topping on it. We talked about it a little bit in the onion episode, how you can get like a crunchy fry on the onion by adding a little bit of flour right before you fry the onions in oil. A cheat that we use when we have osh sometimes is the freeze dried onions that you see like during Thanksgiving and in the holiday season. If you think about like the topping for green bean casserole, that's kind of like that. And also mint, fried dried mint and a little bit of oil just for a short amount of time because it can burn pretty quickly and then you can garnish the top of it as well mm, delicious yeah we can't forget that Ashereshte, it's an iconic soup and it's usually served with kashk right kashk is a sort of yogurt that is strained and thicker mm -hmm. and it results in being more sour than plain yogurt and more salty and it has a very distinctive flavor yeah and many people who grew up eating osh want to have cash get it yeah i prefer plain yogurt in mine mm -hmm. that's how i have it sometimes i'll get sour cream or a low-fat sour cream along with the fried onion garlic mint turmeric topping yeah but my mother-in-law likes to use, instead of cash, ranch dressing. And she's turned my girls onto that. And they look for the ranch. And so they put ranch in their ashrashta. And I think that's a, an interesting modern twist. Yeah, I have never had ranch on my ashrashta. <laughs> but I will be making some very soon. And I will try that. And I'll report back to you what I think. Do. If kashka is already on the osh, that sometimes people garnish, I will have some of that, but I don't seek it out. I prefer to have regular yogurt, like a dollop on top of it. And I also sometimes like to add vinegar, like a balsamic vinegar, like a little splash mm. of it. And it really brightens it up because I mean, the osh cooks for a long time and it can be kind of heavy. So a little bit of the acid from the vinegar really brightens it up. Yeah, I feel like vinegar would make it taste a little sophisticated. Mm -hmm. I'd like to try that. Good idea. I think it's important to note that osh can really vary. You were talking about how you can choose what you want based on your flavors you want to taste or what you have on hand, but it really can vary from household to household what they actually put into their osh. I remember growing up a family that we're friends with, they would put beets in their osh. And so sometimes I've even put beet greens in my osh and just chop it up and kind of saute them at the beginning when I'm sauteing like some of the herbs. And you, sometimes people put leeks in there as well. So it can have a lot of different varieties. But let me tell you about when I like to make osh. So traditionally you'll make osh really anytime, but on Persian New Year, you have osh because of the long noodles, to have like rishte zindigi or to have a long, prosperous life. But I actually love to merge Persian and American culture. And I, every year, make it on New Year's Day. Are you talking about American New Year? You serve it on American New Year. Yeah, American New Year's Day, January 1st. Isn't that a fun twist? Because it is traditionally served for Persian New Year on the first day of spring. Yep, that's right. And what I do also is I add black eyed peas to it because that's actually like a Southern tradition that you have black eyed peas on New Year's Day. So I make my ashishte with black eyed peas. And what I typically do is have an open house. And so all my hungover friends and really <laughs> anyone who wants to come by and have a bowl of soup for good luck for that year will stop by, have a bowl. I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do it this year, or what that's going to look like based on current shelter in place restrictions and things like that. I love everything about the whole concept behind that. You're merging our cultures. Uh -huh. Black eyed peas are so delicious. Mm -hmm. I could see that it would be better than getting Mexican food when you're hungover. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I know. It is so good for you. So that's when I like to serve it. And I'm hoping that I can continue that tradition and share it with friends this year as well. Well, hey, we can't talk about soup without talking about abgusht. Absolutely. Tell us about abgusht, Bita June. Abgusht has a couple different components to it. But basically, it's a rich broth that's simmered. Typically, it's made with like lamb, bone-in lamb, simmered all day. So the broth is cooked with the lamb and typically like white beans, mint. And then after it's done cooking, you kind of separate out the beans and the lamb and you kind of puree 
the beans and you serve the op gush as like this beautiful broth and on the side you have the gush kubide which is basically the meat and the beans that are mashed together sometimes you have bread and you soak the bread into the bowl of the broth have that with like fresh herbs and onions or torshi on the side op gush it's so comforting like i love broth and I love soups like that but I pretty much probably butchered that recipe right there so you know about it a little bit better than me you've made it more than me tell me about it I don't actually make it a ton in the traditional way I have my own versions that are vegetarian which is the opposite of what abgusht means yeah the broth of meat (laughs) Meat. (laughs) that's the literal translation but my mom likes to make it for cozy nights in and I think if I remember correctly she puts potatoes Potatoes, garbanzos, chickpeas. Mm -hmm. It has a little bit of maybe stewed tomatoes, yummy cinnamon. I don't know all the spices. I can tell you what I put in my vegetarian version, which I actually call Moroccan stew. (laughs) And there are similarities. Mm -hmm. And let me guess, you cook yours in the Instapot. I do, yeah. Yeah. I just saute some onion and olive oil and garlic. And I use cinnamon, paprika, and cumin, and vegetable broth, chickpeas, carrots, potatoes. Sometimes I'll throw in bell peppers if I have them. And then I put fresh spinach at the very end. Oh, It's so good. I guess it's the chickpeas and some of the spices that reminds me of Mm abgoosht. But what kind of spices are you used to having in your abgoosht? You know, you could have a little bit of different flavor profiles. You've had versions that have like tomatoes in it. There's also versions that have limu and they call it abgush limu mm. and so that's a little bit more tart but i think mint plays a big role really uh uh-huh, in that version at least so when i think about abgush i think about a flavor that has mint in with the broth i love abgush that's definitely a fun persian soup and then let's talk about really quickly about super joe i remember having super joe like as a little kid it's so creamy and comforty tell me a little bit about super joe Yeah, we have a family recipe. Bob's grandma used to make it and my girls grew up eating it and it's definitely a comfort soup. So the funny thing is that with my limited Farsi, I used to wonder who Joe was. (laughs) Who's this Joe who has this yummy, creamy soup? I finally asked who's Joe and learned that Joe is the word for barley. So it's a creamy barley soup. Mm -hmm. Our family recipe has carrots and some potatoes. And with the help of my mom-in-law, We came up with an Instant Pot recipe version. We actually take a little immersion blender and we use that at the very end and sometimes add a little bit of milk or cream Mm -hmm. and that turns it more into like a barley cream soup. Okay. It's really nice. It's simple flavors, not spicy and really comforting. Yeah, sounds delicious. What's our Ask the Beats question today? Yeah. We love it when our listeners participate. We do have a question today from Little Persian Learning from Instagram. And her question is, is it traditional that the meat is very well done in Persian food? I think that's a great question because I think that's great to note that the meats are not cooked under. They are cooked well done. Persian stews that are slow cooked and simmered. And the meats and Persian foods are definitely cooked all the way through. What do you have to say about that? I think the reason that Persian meats are cooked all the way through is because they're often and traditionally simmered for a long period of time Mm -hmm. in the stews, a lot of times even in a pressure cooker. So the old fashioned, big bulky pressure cookers, or today in the instant pots, they definitely cook to the point of almost falling apart. They're not dry necessarily because, you know, they're cooked with sauces and delicious things, but they're the kind of like almost that fall apart type of meat. Yeah. In terms of kebabs, they're cooked all the way through, but they're also not dry because of both method and ingredients. So either marinated in olive oil or some form of fat is like added a lot of times. Like if it's not a fatty meat, like a butter or saffron is added. Yeah. But yeah always very well done, I would say. I think also if you're looking to cook with like poultry, you don't need to actually cook that so hard that it gets dry. Like if you're cooking with chicken breast, for example, I don't think you need to cook it so long. So if you're cooking your recipe and you're making it with chicken breast or you're subbing in poultry for the red meat, you don't have to let it cook as long as maybe it would if it was going to be with red meat. Oh, yeah. 
Good point. Cool. Well, thank you so much for asking that great question. And again, if anyone has any questions regarding anything in this episode or any Persian food questions that they want to ask, please feel free to give us a shout out on social media or sending us an email at hello at modernpersianfood.com. And we'd love to feature you in a future episode. Thanks, Bita. Bye. So you've been listening to Modern Persian Food with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling your friends or giving us a good rating on iTunes. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app or find us online at modernpersianfood.com for recipes and info that we talked about today. Thanks so much. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time.